And that's what we're talking about today. Let's pray and ask the Lord as we talk about the power of one. Father God, I pray that you would bless us today. Father, I thank you for this worship we had today. I thank you for these people that have come out to your house. Father, thank you for last week and last month. But Father, we're not satisfied with the blessings of the past. We want you to do it again. Do it again in our hearts and do it again in our lives. And after it's all been said and done and we leave this building today, let us know that we know that we know we have been in your house. Let us know we've been in your presence in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Give the Lord praise one final time. Can you do that? Come on, make some noise. Now that's good for a mayor or a senator. I'm talking about the king of kings. Come on, give him praise. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, my brother. Well, how many feel good? Raise your hand. All right, how many look good? Raise your hand. How many other person next to you lied? It's okay. Go ahead. Raise your hand. Hey, can I get a little bit of a house light so I can see some of the people instead of not just feeling like I'm in here by myself? There, there you are. Uh, today I want to talk to you about the power of one. Will you say that with me? The power of one. Come on with the attitude. The power of one. There are four commitments in life that I believe God wants us to make. Uh, I'm going to blow through three of them very quickly, and we're going to park on the last one. But uh, we are committed to four things, I believe, in life. Number one, we're to be committed to people. Someone say people. People, uh, the, there are relationships that God desires for us to establish, not to be separate, but to be linked together and continually growing in him. The second thing we're to be committed to are habits. Someone shout habits. Habits are things like tithing on a regular basis, as Pastor was talking about, getting in the Word every day, praying every day, coming to church. These are habits that I believe as believers in Christ Jesus we should be developing each and every day in our lives. The third thing is we're committed to a purpose, and that purpose is one that helps us to continually grow in God. So we're committed to people, number one. Number two, committed to habits. Number three, committed to a purpose. And then fifth and or fourth and finally, we're committed to a mission to be fulfilled. Filled. I'm reading this morning in the book of Acts chapter 20 and verse 24. No need to turn there. I'll quote it to you very quickly. But Acts 20, 24, Paul says this incredible statement. He says, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus Christ has given me, it's the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. How many of you know God wants us to finish the race? Every one of us have an eternal destiny. There's a divine purpose that has been given to each and every one of us. You have, an, you have a mission to be fulfilled. You have an assignment that has been given to you by the Lord, an assignment that will one day cause the books to be open and for God to say, well done. I don't know about you, Red Life, but I want to hear God say, well done. People that make an impact upon their world are people that understand their mission. They're not wasting their lives away like so many others, and they understand that their mission in life matters. Uh, they're not, there's people that get up every day and they have no idea why they're even created. They have no idea what they're doing or what their purpose is. And so I want you to listen carefully because this may be one of the most profound statements I make today. You are not ready to live until you understand the reason for which you would be willing to die. Can I say that again? You are not ready to live until you understand the reason that you would be willing to die. And if there's nothing that you would die for, then you don't understand your mission. You're not really prepared to live a life successfully unless there's something in your gut that says, you know what, I would lay down my life for this. We understand many years ago it was Paducah, Kentucky, it was Pearl, Mississippi, it was Jonesboro, Arkansas, it was Sandy Hook and the Batman Theater in Denver, Colorado. And many of us can remember, it seems like it was a blink, but it was many years ago, Columbine, when Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold marched into Columbine High School. They had a sawed-off shotgun, two 9 millimeter pistol Glocks, left 15 kids laying in a puddle of their own blood and took their own lives. We all know the stories of Rachel Scott and Cassie Bernal, who was the first to American martyr on American soil in many years when they were putting a gun to people's heads and asking them, do you believe in God? And if they said yes, they were murdering them. So with a gun pointed in her face, knowing that her life would depend on the answer she gave without even hesitation, she said, yes, I believe in God. I believe some things are bigger than our own pettiness. Can I get a big amen? I believe some things are more important in life than a 401K or putting a kid through school or getting a retirement all set up. There's got to be something in our life that is more important. And Paul said, my mission in life matters. 
He said, I consider, in Acts 20, 24, we just read it, I consider my life worth nothing unless I finish the race and complete the task. What was Paul saying? Paul was saying life is a routine. Life is a rut. Life is a ritual. Life is boring unless I'm willing to do what God's called me to do. I don't know all of you personally, and I could tell you what you do every day. Are you ready? You get up, you walk around, you talk, you eat a few meals, and you go to bed. That's it. Like, I do a lot more than that. Okay, you get up, you go to school, you go to work, you come home, you watch a little Netflix, you go to bed. <laughs> you say, well, I do a whole lot more than that. Okay, I'm going to make it splashy. You get up, you get dressed, you put on a little makeup, right? Some of you guys, you know, you fix your hair, you comb your beard, you do whatever. You get on Facebook, you get on Twitter, you get on Snapchat, you get on Instagram. We go to school, we go to work, we go to the grocery store, we go to the dry cleaners, we go to the post office. We come home, we watch TV, and then we go to bed, and then ultimately we die. <laughs> I mean, that's it. We do the same things over and over and over. And Paul said, man, my life is worth nothing unless I'm ready to do the work that God has called me to do. And so I'm going to give you this morning just literally four quick points, and we're going to go eat some. We'll see if it's good barbecue. I'm from Texas. This man is really talking way before I eat the food. Texas is very proud of two things. Number one, Texas. <laughs> And barbecue, <laughs> they're, 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 and steaks, I'll throw in that. They're, they're proud of their meat in Dallas, Texas. But I'm going to give you four today, and here's the first one. It is our mission. Someone say, my mission. My mission is to bring others into God's family. Isn't that so simple, yet it's so profound, and how awesomely important. You say, well, I thought my mission in life was to be a doctor. I thought my mission in life was to be a, a lawyer. I thought my mission in life was to, uh, to be a contractor or a veterinarian or a plumber. Or I thought my mission in life was to get married and have a little white picket fence and a dog and a cat and two kids. And all those are assignments from the Lord as well. But the mission that I'm talking about today goes a lot deeper than that. And the bottom line of all of our missions is to bring others into God's family. Romans chapter 10 and verse 13 says, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But who can ask unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard? And how can they hear unless what? Somebody preaches to them. Somebody tells them. How did you get into God's family? Somebody told you about it. You didn't know about Jesus. You didn't know about Calvary. You didn't know about the cross. You didn't know that the blood could change your life unless somebody would have told you about it in Sunday school when you were a child. Or perhaps you heard about Christ on television or a radio broadcast. Maybe it was a youth pastor or a pastor or a mother, a father, a neighbor, a best friend, a co-worker. But somebody told you about Jesus. And there's a great, big, wonderful world out there called Brookville, Indiana, and all the surrounding areas. Some got, somebody's got to tell them about Jesus. Amen? So, you know, and no wonder Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, he said, you shall be my, what did he say? You shall be my what? Witnesses. Will you say that with me? You shall be my witnesses. Do you know there's only one qualification to being a witness, and that's were you there when it happened? Do you know that? You could be a witness to an accident. You could be a witness to a marriage ceremony. You could be a witness to a funeral. You could be a witness to the signing of a document. The only thing necessary for you to be a witness is where are you there when it happened. I can promise you I'll go back to Cincinnati tomorrow. I'll jump on a plane. I'll go back to Texas. But let's say tomorrow you went to the bank. I don't know. Maybe you were going to make a deposit or a little withdrawal or something like that. And let's say while you were in there, all of a sudden a getaway car scurried up to the front, and they left it idling in there. Four guys ran into the place. They had pantyhose on their head, and they put four bullets in the ceiling. Everybody Everybody collapsed on the ground, and they stuck the place up, and they started stuffing money in bags, and all of a sudden, they sped off in that getaway car. You know what they're going to do? They're going to come in there. They're going to lock the doors of that bank. There's going to be police. There's going to be FBI. There's going to be state patrolmen. There's going to be a reporters. They're going to be dusting for fingerprints, and they're going to want to interview the what? They're not going to call me in Dallas and ask me what happened. I wasn't there. I wasn't there when it went down. But you could say, I was there. A witness tells the story of what happened. You can say, it was crazy. I was in here. All of a sudden, four guys came in. Two were tall. One was kind of thick. One was short. You know what? They shot the gun. They made off all those. A witness just tells the story of what happened. And the same is true concerning your relationship with Christ and your ability to be a proper witness for him. Were you there when it happened? Did you experience a change in your life? You may not understand a lot, but you can say, you know what? I'm a witness to the blood of Jesus Christ. A witness just tells the story 
of what happened. And so we have to understand that that's what Matthew is talking about in chapter 28 and verses 19 and 20. It's the great commission. It's not the great suggestion. It's not God's take it or leave it proposition. God didn't say, well, when you have an occasional weekend or if you have a spare hour or two. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So regardless of who you are or what you do, or where you work, or where you go to school. Your mission in life should be, Father God, as I go to work, as I go to school, as I go do my errands throughout the day, as I'm on the phone, as if I'm on social media, let me be bringing others into God's family. If you believe it, say amen. Amen. So number one, we have a mission. Number two, we have a motive. Someone say, my motive. All right, my motive is my love for God and my love for people. Why do we want to bring people into the family of God? Because we love God and we love people. You thought you were going to get a deep theological sermon today, didn't you? This is about as deep as it gets. Why do we want to bring people to red life? Why would we want to do an activity out here on today, a little block party, and have folks come? Why would we come back to church tonight and perhaps bring a family member or a friend or somebody that's unsaved? Because we love God and we love people. 2 Peter 3 and 9 says the Lord is patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but wants everyone to come to him. Do you realize God never met a person he didn't love? You have. I feel like preaching now. You say, oh, pastor, I love everybody. You need to shut your mouth. You don't love everybody. (laughs) Family reunions, need I say anything else? I go to my family reunions and the spirit of slap comes on me almost instantaneously because I just want to smack their face. (laughs) Want to know why? Because they're stupid. I got a cousin. Are we we filming this? (laughs) Is this streaming? And I'm telling you, he doesn't go to church and he's always getting in trouble. And then he wants to come talk to the preacher and the family for free counseling. Can I tell you guys something? I'm the world's worst counselor. I I think most people just need some discipline in their lives. I'm serious. I I have people coming to me and go, I've been struggling with this and that and, you know, this. And I just want to, I always look at them and go, how much do you pray? Huh? How much do you read your Bible? And I always get them, well, not as much as I should. No, 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 no. Give me minutes. Then they get embarrassed. But you know what? I've been in ministry 35 years, Pastor, and I've never one time had someone come to me and say, you know what, Pastor? I pray an hour a day. I read my Bible an hour a day, and I just can't seem to get rid of this issue. See, I've never had that happen once. Because how many of you know when we're in the Word of God, and how many know when we're talking to God, things that used to slip you up and trip you up won't even be issues anymore? Can you get an amen? I had a lady come to me one time. She said, the devil's been on my back. She said, the devil's been on my back. And I said, really? And she said, yeah. I said, really? She said, he's been on my back, Pastor Michael. He's been with me all week. He hadn't left me alone one time. And I said, you know what? You're the most arrogant woman I've ever met in my entire life. And she's like, huh? I said, you said the devil's been on your back? She goes, he has. I said, he's been with you all week? She goes, absolutely. I said, he hadn't left you alone one time? She's not not a moment. I said, man, that's crazy because, you know, the devil's not omnipresent. She goes, what? I said, the devil's not omnipresent. God's omnipresent. She said, what do you mean? I said, he can be anywhere in the universe all at one time. I said, God's omniscient. He knows everything. God's omnipotent. He's all powerful. God's omnipresent. He can be anywhere he wants to be in the entire universe all at the same time. I said, but the devil's not omnipresent. He can only be in one place at one time. She said, really, how can prove that? I said, because he came before God in the book of Job, and God said, where have you been? And he said, roaming to and fro about the earth. You know what? He's a pedestrian. He only be in one place at one time. I said, so you tell me out of all the millions of the people on the planet, he hung out with you all week? <laughs> he shut down hell. Gave all the demons a vacation. I said, honey, he don't even know you exist. And many times we give the devil credit for things that we do not give the devil credit for because he's not responsible for it. How many of you know sometimes it's just you? Come on, somebody. You heard about the two construction workers. The horn went off one day for lunch. Get out there, and they sit down on that iron girder, sit down in their hard hats, open up their lunch boxes. One guy pulls out some nice hot soup and a thermos. He's got some candy. He's got all these fresh bread rolls and, all, and butter. And the guy opens up the other lunch box. He goes, peanut butter and jelly. I hate peanut butter and jelly. 
I hate it. Next day, gets out there, get out the hard hats. One guy pulls out chicken sandwich, pulls out some chips, pulls out a couple of Twinkies, a nice ice cold Coca Cola. The other guy opens his, he goes, peanut butter and jelly. Peanut butter and jelly. This happens day after day after day. Finally, one day, it goes off. They come over, they sit down on that beam, they get their shoes on and their hard hats and sit them down. Guy opens up his and he goes, peanut butter and jelly. I hate peanut butter and jelly. And the guy looks over and he goes, dude, if you don't like peanut butter and jelly so much, tell your wife to make you something else. He goes, you leave my wife out of this. I make my own lunch. (laughs) So you know what? Sometimes it's not the enemy. Sometimes it's just us. But I have to understand that, you know what, there's, there's something inside my DNA that I don't love everybody. My family reunions, they get, they, they get on my nerves. Do I love them? Yes. Do they annoy me? Yes. Do some of them get on my nerves? Yes. Do some of them need Jesus? Yes. But do I love them? Yes. Why? Because they're my family. And so when I love God, it gives me a love for people that on my own DNA I wouldn't have. When I so fall in love, when I fall so in love with Jesus, it gives me an uncommon love for others. So number one, my mission is to bring others into God's family. My motive is my love for God and my love for people. And number three is my message. Someone shout my message. My message is the good news. Amen. Some people say, well, that's my religion. <laughs> Some people say, well, that's my denomination. Other people say, well, that's my faith. I just like to call it the good news. Best news you ever heard, amen? <laughs> then it was, is that not the best news you ever heard? Did it not change your life? Hallelujah. I, 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 I love the good news. It says in 2 Peter 3 and 9, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, it's Mark 16, 15. It says, proclaim the good news to everyone everywhere. <laughs> well, Brother Michael, where should I talk to people about the Lord? Proclaim the good news to everyone Everywhere. Well, what particular scenario should I wait to see and recognize in order to be able to spread my faith? Proclaim the good news, say it with me, to everyone, every, shout it out, everyone, everywhere. That sums it up. That's at school, that's at home, that's on social media, that's on, on the athletic field, that's in the mall, the grocery store. And people tell me all the time, they're like, well, it's just so hard, you know, Brother Michael, for me to share the good news. Well, that's because you forgot how good the good news is. Come on now, because if you have good news that's so amazing and so incredible, how many know you can hardly wait to tell somebody? Let me just give you all all a point uh, that you need to know about me. I'm the world's worst secret keeper. (laughs) If you don't want somebody to know something, don't tell me. People come to me all the time, oh, my goodness, Pastor Michael, i got to tell you this, but don't tell anybody. I go, then don't tell me. (laughs) I can't stand it. What if Ed McMahon and Dick Clark, remember that? Publisher's Clearing House, remember that back in the day? Publisher's Clearing House, and boy, they'd show up with the balloons and a big old check for a million dollars. If you got a million dollars, you te- first you'd come to church and give you 10%. Can I get an amen? But after that, you tell everybody they know it all over town. Why? Because it's good news. What if your kid got a free ride to one of the top colleges in the, in, in the world, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Carnegie Mellon, Brown University? Uh, what, what would you do? Man, we'd pull him up on stage, and we'd say, everybody, Timmy got a free ride to Harvard University, and we'd all stand up and applaud. Why? Because it's good news. My wife and I, uh, many, many years ago, uh, I, I've been married twice, and my, my first wife, many, many years ago, this was like long before things in my life, long before Jesus and serious things. And uh, we got married, and, and uh, we were trying to have a child. And, and one day, she, she was acting a little erratic. <laughs> you know, she was just acting a little erratic. I'm really, I'm being kind. I really wanted to go, where's your broom? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> She's acting a little erratic. And I went to her and I said, you know what? You're acting a little erratic. Maybe you're pregnant. She goes, I'm not pregnant. I know my own body. I know my DNA. I know my body. I know what's going on in there chemically. I'm like, well, you're acting a little erratic. I said, maybe you should go get a pregnancy test or something like that. She goes, would you go get that for me? Okay. First of all, ladies, there's things that guys don't like to buy. (laughs) Can we just establish that with all you women right now? There's just things that men, there are certain aisles 
that we, like, we don't like to go around. But I went in there, and I got it, and I kind of shoved it under my arm, and I'm kind of sneaking it out, did the self-checkout, you know, so I didn't have to see anybody. And I go home, and I give it to her, and she goes, what's this? I said, it's a pregnancy test. She goes, this is the EPT. I said, I know. Go tinkle on it. Let's see what's going on. She goes, no, I wanted a clear blue easy. I'm like, what? You got? I didn't want an EPT. I wanted a clear blue easy. She goes, you need to go back and get that one, and plus, there's some other things that I need you to get. Now, again, lady, I want to emphasize, there's just certain things with wings, you know, that we don't really like to, certain aisles we don't want to be around, right? But I went in there, and sure enough, I got to go down the aisle that has the things. And you'd have thought it was a drug deal. I literally put it in my arm and I'm walking out like this. You know? I'm buying Pringles and chips and Doritos and everything I can to cover up the things because the self-checkout was broke. So I had to see a woman with things in my hand. And I, I don't want to, so she's just taking all this stuff, and I've got all this food and everything all covered up on top of it. And she's like, bloop, bloop, bloop. She grabs the things and goes, she goes, I need a price check on it. I'm like, you don't need a price check. I'll give you $1,000. I'll give you $1,000 right now. <laughs> so we have to check out, go home. She does her thing. We're waiting, right? Because back in the day, it was more complicated. Now the things talk to you, all kinds of stuff. Back in the day, now there's a little speaker in there. You're pregnant. <laughs> but do you remember back in the day, it was one line, eh, two lines, yeah. And so we're literally sitting there, we're putting away you know, all the things that I bought. It was like the longest two minutes of our lives. And so finally I go in there and I grab it. Now the woman that was like, I'm not pregnant, I know my own body. She's like, what does it say, what does it say? I was like, this, la, 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 la. She's like, let me see it. I'm like, la, 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 la. She goes, is it one line or two? I'm like, I don't know, you're talking so loud, it's confused me. She's like, quit playing around, Michael. Is it one line or two? I'm like, what do you mean? Did she got, what, what's that? She's like, is it got two? And I went like that, and she goes, ah! And, man, I picked up the phone, and can I tell y'all, AT&T had a holiday on that day. I called family. I called friends. I called neighbors. I called people. I didn't even know who they were. Hey, who's this? I'm going to be a dad. <laughs> Why? Because it's good news. But can I tell you something, Red Life? You've got the good news. His name is Jesus Christ, and a lost and dying world has got to know the good news. Come on and give him praise if you believe that today. All four of you, praise the God. <laughs> The good news, so you know what? We have a mission to bring others into God's family. We have a motive. It's my love for God and my love for people. We have a mission to bring others into God's family, a motive, my love for God, my love for people. My message is the good news. And fourth and finally, we have a method. Someone say my method. A mission, a motive, a message, and a method. And what is the method? It's to live it and to share it. To live it and to share it. Can I share with you one of my favorite scriptures? It's found in the book of Titus. And uh, the book of Titus says, show you can be fully trusted so that in every way you can show the teaching of God attractive. Look this way for a second. God wants you to make his gospel attractive. Who'd want to follow you if you have no joy? Who'd want to follow you if you get your teeth kicked in by the enemy all the time? Who'd want to follow you if they don't think what you have is attractive? And I know I'm a little out there. Some of you didn't know I'm pretty extroverted. <laughs> I'm excited all the time. Because it's good news. It's amazing. And Paul said, my life doesn't even matter unless I'm doing what God has called me to do. Tell others about Jesus. God is trusting you. Titus says, show you can be fully trusted to show the teaching of God attractive. Guess what? He's leaving it up to you. Did you know that? He's leaving it up to you in 2022 to tell this world how awesome he is. He's leaving it up to you. You know he's God. He could do whatever he wanted to do. You do understand that he could bring down a million angels, 
millions of angels all around the world in a display of color and light and simultaneously billions of people on the globe would recognize his glory, but he doesn't do that. He leaves it up to us. Quirky, half in, half out, lazy sometimes, apathetic. Just don't sit here and tell me you run around with joy and victory every day. Life beats us up and sometimes we're just discouraged. Sometimes we get bad news. Sometimes we're not the best representation of who he is. But what if I told you that Titus said he's trusting us? He's trusting us. That's a big responsibility. I'm sick of this world. I'm just being really transparent with you guys. I'm tired of this world. I want to go see Jesus. But until then, we have a responsibility. Have you ever heard the old saying, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good? There's a lot of believers in churches like that right now. And I talk to Christians all the time. Want to go home? Want to go home? Want to go to heaven? Want to go see my family, my loved ones, my friends? Want to see Jesus? Want to see the Lord? I do too. But guess what? Until that day, we have work to do. What if I would have told you that we'd be where we are today? You wouldn't have even believed me. If I would have told you about the last 24 to 36 months, you wouldn't have even believed me. We are messed up. We have a world where we can't call it Mr. Potato Head. Hey, it's a potato. <laughs> it's a potato. It's a toy potato that we can't call Mr. anymore. We have now a gender neutral potato. Is that the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard? Mr. Coffee, you're next. <laughs> you forget about eating a man, which canceled. Did you hear the latest? Eskimo Pies? Did you hear that? Eskimo Pies is canceling their name. You can now no longer call it an Eskimo Pie. It's offensive to indigenous people. <laughs> I can't make this stuff up. They're pulling now Sleeping Beauty. Do you know that? Pulling it. Pulling it from the shelves. Want to know why? Because she did not give the prince consent to kiss her. That's where we are. Guess what? I have a lot of uh, Indian friends. And there's not one single one of them that was ticked off that they were called the, Wiz the Redskins. <laughs> the Redskins. Can't call them that. Well, what about the Pittsburgh Pirates? Weren't they terrible people? <laughs> what about the Minnesota Vikings? Didn't they rape and pillage? What? Where does this end? It's insanity. It's insanity that the woman of the year was a dude. <laughs> It is insanity that women that have trained their entire lives to win a competition are now being beat by men in swimming. And their whole life goals and dreams and accomplishments are ripped away because someone said they feel like today they're something that they're not. Uh, I don't care what you all believe, but we can settle this when everybody just looks in their pants. Can I get an amen? Come on, somebody. <laughs> That's right, I said it. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And while the world just keeps raging towards destruction, it's a lot like the Titanic, honestly. The Titanic was warned 12 times to turn around. Did you know that? 12 times they said, turn around. 12 times they told them change course a dozen different occasions you can read in history books they said you're going the wrong way and they would not turn around and so on april 14th 1912 the world's most luxurious ship struck an iceberg ripping a 300 foot gash in her side this ship of power and grace and elegance said to be unsinkable one newspaper said god couldn't sink this ship and 1422 people died as 713 survivors watched in utter horror all because they would not 
go the right way. And we are a modern day Titanic. In 2022, we are sinking. Did you know that the captain of the ship, you can see it in the movie, they give one little shot towards it. Do you remember in the scene where the symphony comes up and begins to play? That happened. The captain of that Titanic told them, even as the ship was taking on water, all is well. The ship is unsinkable. And he told the symphony, take four pieces and go up and play music so that it will put everybody in a better mood and calm everybody down. Here we are in 2022, sinking miserably. And while the band continues to play, and political leaders are saying, all is well, we are on a crash course. So you know what I give you today? I came a lot of miles to tell somebody in this room, you have a mission. Someone say loudly, my mission. My mission is to bring others into God's family. Someone say my motive. My motive is my love for God, and it gives me love for people I would never love on my own. I don't have the capacity for it. I can't even people most days. They get on my nerves. But guess what? I love the Father so much. He gives me an uncommon love for people I'd never like on my own. Someone say my message. My message is the good news. And guess what? If you're not sharing it, and you forgot how good the good news is. Because when you have news that's so amazing, gosh, you just got to tell somebody. And then fourthly, my motive. My motive is to live it and to share it. Look at me this morning. You may be the only Bible that some people ever read. You may be the only church that some people ever attend. You, my friend, may be the only Jesus that some people ever see. And I want to be one of those people that survives as our nation sinks to the bottom of the ocean. He's coming. He's coming. I've heard it my whole life. My whole life, he's coming soon. He's coming soon, Pastor. We've grown up ministry. We heard it since Sunday school. Jesus is coming soon. But guess what? Stuff had to take place. Prophecies had to be fulfilled. There had all kinds of things had to fall in line. It is done. Look at the news, dear God. It's like watching and reading Revelation on television. Remember those few little scriptures that we haven't read in a long time? When there's wars, when there's rumors of wars, when there's famine, when there's pestilence, when men become lovers of themselves, when men have a form of godliness but deny the power they're in, these are the birth pains. Look up. We just had a whole month where homosexuality, transgender, bisexuals was thrown in our face. And people tell me all the time, Michael, you're just too harsh preaching. You're just too harsh. You need to calm it down a little bit. This world has no problem shoving their junk in my face, so I have no difficulty shoving Jesus in theirs. If you were standing on a railroad track and you had headphones on and you were just jamming out the tunes and a train was coming and about to bowl you over, and you were unaware of it because you had headphones on, wouldn't you want me to push you out of the way? That's what I'm doing every Sunday of my life. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, you can dim the lights if you'd like to. No one talking, no one looking around. The service will be over in moments. But I'd be doing a disservice to my ministry. I'd be doing a disservice to your pastor. I'd be doing a disservice to the Lord. I'd definitely be doing a disservice to you if I didn't ask you one probing, penetrating question this morning. How is it between you and God? That's all I'm going to ask you. 
I didn't ask you how much you pray. I didn't ask you how much you read your Bible. I didn't ask you how much church attendance you go to. I'm not asking you any of those things. I'm asking you right now, what is the spiritual temperature of your relationship with you and Jesus? If this sky cracked open today and simultaneously millions and millions of people around the globe were caught up in the clouds to meet him, would you go? Don't answer, it's rhetorical. Some of you probably couldn't answer out loud anyway, but I'm just asking, are you sure? Because if you're not sure, you're not ready. What if your heart stopped beating right now? (laughs) That quick, and you didn't have time to say your little cute prayer of repentance. What if you had an aneurysm? and you fell over dead and you didn't have time to say your little 30 second oh Lord I'm sorry I do love you I want to believe in you save me what if you didn't have time the Bible says wide is the way that leads to destruction and many find it and narrow is the way that leads to righteousness and not many find it but few I find it funny and sad at the same time that there's a highway to hell but a stairway to heaven. It kind of lets you know about the traffic patterns. So I'm not going to have you stand. I'm not going to bring down a worship team to sing songs. We're not going to do a little prayer tunnel. I'm not going to have a prayer team. I'm not going to touch you on the head. I'm just going to say if you're here today and you say, Brother Michael, I'm not where I need to be with Jesus, would you pray with me? I'm just going to have you slip up your hand on the count of three, and I'll pray with you right where you sit. One, two, three. Boom. Is there anyone? Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else? Could we all pray this prayer together? Please don't mumble it. Red Life, say it loud and proud. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I love you so much. And Father, I thank you for sending your Son to take my place. Jesus, I'm not perfect, and I make mistakes, but I come before you today asking that you would cleanse me, wash me, purify my heart and my life, consume me with your presence, cover me with the blood of Calvary. My life is yours. Place my name in that book, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Can you give him the greatest ovation you can give him right now? Come on, all around the room. Come on, give him glory, give him honor, give him praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Did that help somebody today? I pray that it did. I pray that it did. You can go ahead and bring the house loves up again. Uh, In just a moment, pastor's going to come. He's going to give you an opportunity to bless the ministry. But let me say two things very quickly. If you did sponsor a child, Uh, please make sure you see me at the table. And then back on the table, we have nine discs. Uh, They are basically the best of the best of the best. They are the most requested messages in our ministry. uh, And they're back there for sale. And we do that for two reasons. How many of you know, I just came here for today. How many of you know, I can't give you everything that God has put inside of us in one day. That's impossible. And then the second reason we do it is how many of you know, anything that we can do to expand the gospel. Amen? Amen. And these discs have been all over the world, places where I may never even darken the door. One's called How to Survive Stress. I'm just going to talk to you. We're going to be the only ones honest in church today. How many know when you got saved, that didn't make you bulletproof from the pressures and the trials of life? Come on, we still have bad days. We still wake up on the wrong side of the bed. We still beat our kids. Come on now, you don't know. <laughs> we, look at somebody acting spiritual. Some of you were driving to work last week, and someone cut you off, and you were like, hey, go to heaven. <laughs> so, But God gave me three simple things that you can do to overcome stress. We got one back there called your loneliness in God's presence. Pastor, can I say this? We are the most medicated nation on the globe. Dear God, folks, I'm telling you, we got a pill and a potion and a powder for everything. There's a Walgreens and a CVS on every corner in every city in America. I went to the uh, doctor, or not the doctor, I went to the Walgreens last week because I had a headache, and I just want to get some strength. Um, Did you know that strength is unavailable? You can't even get it anymore. I went in, I said, I'd like a headache uh, medicine. Do you have some strength? She goes, we got extra strength. And I was like, well, I just want strength. It's not that bad. She goes, no, we got extra strength. 
I'm like, I don't need it. It's not that bad. It, 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 you can't get strength. Now it's extra strength. Guess what they got now? Maximum strength. <laughs> Give me the maximum. Whatever will kill me and back it off a little bit. That's what I want. And then they got the fast acting, but there's long lasting. Do I want to feel good now or later? I don't know. So I decided to Google this. Ready for this, Pastor? The number, I thought it would be ADHD. It really did. But the number one most medicated emotion in America is loneliness. People that can be in a room full of people like this yet feel like they're all by themselves. I don't feel like that was God's plan for his church. And so we teach you in that how loneliness, turn loneliness into aloneness. How do I know there's a difference? You can be alone but not lonely in Jesus. There's a three-part series on prayer. The Titanic is back there. All kinds of discs. These discs are normally $25, but today and today only, uh, we're not doing them $25 a piece, $24.99. And it's very rare that we do that. It's a joke, people. Oh my God, it's a tough crowd. No, actually, we do, uh, if you, it's, there are nine of them and they're 25 a piece. That's $225. We couldn't do that. If you sow a seed at $99, we just give you the whole table. You get over half the disc for free, half off. We call it the family reunion special. And so you can get that today. We call it that because how many of you know for every normal family member you have, you have one that's half off. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. So anyway, those discs are back there. Pastor's going to give an opportunity to sow into this ministry. Uh, listen, folks, I did not tell the pastor, you have to have this main amount of people there. You can tell you I never said that. I didn't say, Pastor, we have to have this amount of money or we're not coming. We didn't say that. I said, get me there in a place to stay. I said, get me there in a place to stay. And both services take up a free will love offering. Do we need a great love offering? Yes. Do we have a budget? Is it big? Yes. Does the pastor know what it is? He does not. We have been to the largest churches in the country. Folks, I was at Cross Church in San Benito three months ago. They had 9,000 people there on Sunday morning, Pastor. 9,000 in one service on Sunday morning. The next Sunday, y'all want to know Kokomo is, right? The city of firsts. I was in Kokomo, Indiana, and I preached in a pastor's living room to 17 people in folding chairs. So I went from 9,000 to 17. So we go wherever the Lord opens up the door, but it's because of faithful giving, uh, like in the offering the pastor is going to let you uh, receive now that help us to do what we do. And we can also swipe an offering. So praise the Lord for technology. If you come and you weren't prepared, we can swipe an offering. But thank you guys so much. Tonight at 6.30, it's going to be an awesome night. I'm going to come a little bit more jeans and tennis shoes if that's all right tonight. So tonight at 6.30, come casual. It's not going to be long, but it is going to be an awesome time together. Welcome back. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the, the, the best pastors I've ever known in my entire existence. Put your hands together for Pastor Justin Bradley. Come on, everybody. Thanks. Uh, we'll just keep that on recording and do that every time before I come up on Sundays from now. That'll be good. <laughs> yeah. Amen. How many appreciate that ministry this morning? Amen. That was a good word. We appreciate that. So uh, there are baskets, uh, separate, different baskets, the uh, wicker baskets on the tables. If you want to give and bless uh, Brother Rowan today, uh, you can do that. Put that in there. If you uh, and uh, if he has a bill, if you want to give uh, to swipe, you can swipe him right because yeah. If you do texting through our through our system. We're not going to be able to tell what's going to what. So if you want to give electronically, do that. And, uh, and again, don't forget your regular tithe and offering, too. We appreciate that. Hey, Amen. You guys ready to hang out, eat, have some fun today, man? Let's do that. Let's stand. Only stand on our feet. Stand on our feet. Stand on our feet, everybody all across this place. Let's stand. Let's say one last closing word of prayer. And, uh, and I'll just pray over the food. And I think it's all ready to go. And uh, we can do that. Anything else? All right. 6.30 tonight. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your time, this time together in your word, God. I thank you for challenging us, Lord, uh, to go and be about your business, to be about the mission that you put us on this earth to do. And I just thank you for that right now. I just speak that over, over this house, over Red Life again. God, you have placed us in Brookfield, Indiana, God, to be a place of freedom and encouragement, to reach, encourage, the disciple. And Lord, I pray that, God, we will commit to that mission, to that vision every single day, every single week, Father God, and to walk through and do it in whatever method and whatever way that you call us to in Jesus' name. Thank you for stirring that up in us today, Father. Bless the food as we begin to prepare it, and these uh, next couple of hours we get to hang, hours as we hang out and uh, just fellowship with one another in your presence. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen and amen. Give somebody a big high five, man. Uh, Pastor Michael's back at the table. You can uh, meet him. Check out some of his merch there. And uh, line up. Let's eat. Let's put it to the test. Let's see.